you're welcome. Very nice. uh, uh, happy to see all of you today and to not see all of you today that are ready to get out for spring break. Um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, and uh, yeah, excited to talk over um, real estate market and that dynamics and analysis. I'm going to uh, kind of dig a little further into uh, into a little bit more about me to start with. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, I had a lot of fun here at LMU. Um, and coming out of LMU, I didn't quite know exactly what I wanted to do career-wise. I did get my real estate license and I thought about going into brokerage. In the mid eighties, there weren't a lot of females in the brokerage industry at the time. Um, and I ended up going on the corporate side with Coral Partner Enterprises, which started there as a coordinator and um, worked my way up. We created a training program that actually got to, that trained me to become a real estate manager. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the fact that I've been around the business my whole entire life, um, but I didn't really know that there was this niche on the corporate side of tenant representation. So when we talk through the seminar, we're going to talk about what, what I do and what people like me do for other companies. Um, and so we're going to look at the, a bit from the tenant perspective side, but also tying in, you know, from a developer side and really about understanding the market and dynamics. So um, I've been with Wendy's for since 2000. And um, Wendy's is based out of Ohio. We're an international quick service restaurant company with 6,800 restaurants worldwide. We're working towards um, 8,500 by 2025. So we have a team of about 150 people that work towards that growth goal from the CDO down to the VP to the real estate directors, we've got legal support and we've got construction support and design support. So wonderful company, great team. I don't know how many of you know too many things about Wendy's. Um, it's, it's because it's not West Coast based. I don't know where we're all from, but um, Dave Thomas founded the company in 69. Um, he was an adopted um, kind of entrepreneur. And um, he, he's got five values that the company really still works from today. And that's quality is our recipe, which is on every one of our buildings. Do the right thing, treat people with respect, profit's not a dirty word, and give back. So great uh, words to live by. And uh, as does the company. Um, I was going to ask anyone here, or if somebody can raise their hand on Zoom, does anybody know why Wendy's burgers are square? Anybody? Why are Wendy's hamburgers square? They're square if you've ever had a Wendy's hamburger. Anybody? You know what? That would be a really logical solution, but so I feel like that's why, like, sort of like, like that's why people use boxes instead of like right. cylinders. Right. Right. That would that would be a good answer, but it's not the correct answer. Uh -huh. But Dave was this real simple guy, and he says, you know, they're we're gonna have square burgers because we don't cut corners. Oh. <laughs> Super simple. Um, and so I, I am I my family's around the real estate business. I'd like my husband's. Um, Vice President of Real Estate for a company called Every Table, and that's a company that's based out of LA. If you Google them, it's a really exciting company. They're a public benefit corporation. Um, they're a they're a public. They have a public mission, but they're for profit, and they um, they do chef prepared packaged meals to go to try to do, do delicious, affordable meals like grab and go or on college campuses, and they're growing really quickly. He's also been on the tenant side. He's been on the broker side, but he's been on the tenant side with Darden, which is Old Garden Red Lobster, Fleming's. He's been with um, Outback, uh, Blue and Brooks, Outback, etc. cetera. Um, he, he enjoys the tenant side as well. Um, and then just real quickly, I've, um, I have two children. My daughter, Kristen, is a 2012 grad from LMU. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her. She didn't quite know what she was going to do when she graduated. She actually jumped on an airplane with Mark and I to go to ICSC, which we're going to talk about. Um, ICSC is, we still call it International Council of Shopping Centers. Um, 
they have uh, it's a great organization that I'm going to give you information about. Um, but she jumped on an airplane with us and attended the convention and attended some meetings and she ended up getting um, a job with a developer just as an intern right after college. And then she got a real estate license and went into brokerage for about 10 years, just almost 10 years. Um, and just as of December, she just decided to take a step to the tenant rep side. And she's now manager of real estate development with King's Seafood Company. And King's, um, you may know 555, King's Fish House, Meet on Ocean in Santa Monica now. Um, so she's kind of excited. Um, you know, commission brokers, commission based, and you can make a lot of money, but it's very competitive. Um, so you know, it's it's a challenge. So I'll tell you more about the tenant side if you if you are interested. Um, Kristen um, is when we get to the end, and you have my well, you'll have my contact information. But she's also happy to talk to any anybody that's interested, just to give her perspective from you know the student side to grow into the market. And then I have a son, Kevin, who is 29 and he went to Oregon State. So not a lot to talk about with him. Um, but again, it, you know, the real estate piece is really on in my blood. My dad started, his dad was a butcher. My dad got his real estate license, opened up a real estate shop in a lawnmower shop, I guess. And a guy walked in one day, and this sounds like a setup for a joke, but a guy walked into his office one day and um, wanted some help finding a site. So he helped him. Um, he goes, I want to do fast food like McDonald's, but I want to do Mexican food. Said, All right. So we found him site. And then he's like, I don't know what to call it. My dad's like, well, your last name's Bell. How about Taco Bell? <laughs> so he literally found some of the first sites for Glenn Bell. And they remained friends throughout their entire life. Um, he ended up going in-house corporate and then back out to uh, owning property. But again, as much as I was, you know, in the blood in the sense that, you know, you you go and you look at real estate on the weekends and you go check out restaurants. And so it's kind of, you know, it's kind of what you do if you have interest in starting to understand how to know real estate, know markets. So a few things um, that you may hear once or twice, it'll be a bit of a common theme. Number one, I love what I do. And I've been doing it, I say over 30 years, I should just say 35, but it makes me sound older. Um, I love what I do. I've worked with wonderful companies. I've worked with great people. And in this industry, you can be, you meet a lot of great people, great relationships, like well friends. Um, you might also hear me say once or twice back in the day, <laughs> old school, because what we're going to go through as far as analytics and analysis and what we do, what we have at our fingertips today is nothing like what we had when I started. We didn't have cell phones. <laughs> We didn't have computers really when I started. It's really fun to kind of watch the industry evolve. And I love the tools that we have at our fingertips. So um, I want to pass right now if I repeat myself when I do that. Um, and then I want to just really emphasize, we'll say it once and more than once over and over, how important relationships are in this business. And I would say this business and or any business that you're going to get into, you know, really, you know, be communicative, be honest, be responsive, responsible, um, because it goes a long way. And if you intend to be in a career like this, you know, for a long, long time, it, it pays back to, to really be, you know, work with integrity. So, um, you know, I, if anybody from Zoom wants to jump in, but I did want to kind of get a feel of who we have here, just we'll ask a few people, you know, you know, why are you here today? Out of all the seminars, interest, um, anybody want to share if they're heading towards a real estate career or? For sure. Um, so first I heard about this little seminar because my other girlfriend, Tina, um, mm -hmm. she's in finance and she has some requirements to get points and stuff. Um, I'm a junior, so I never had that, but, um, I am very interested in doing residential real estate when older. Oh, great. Um, I actually have a bit of history with that. Oh, and during COVID, I worked uh, in a real estate broker down in Orange County. Lots of fun. Um, but I'm just you know, interested in like what the commercial side of real estate has to offer. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Great. Anybody else? Sure. Uh, so I'm an entrepreneurship major, and I kind of just like to diversify my knowledge and understand. 
understanding of different sectors of business. And I'm kind of here from the investment point of view, trying to see how I can just be smarter in purchasing real estate, mm -hmm. what to do with it, how to be better with it, what's the terminology. Well, this should, I think it will help kind of both of you just give you a different perspective and a lot of what we'll talk through today is going to really apply to if you're out there looking for a piece of property and you're you're going to buy that property but who are you going to put on there you want somebody to pay rent right? right so how do you find the right piece of property so we'll kind of work right into that um can anybody tell me what uh the three Probably most important things in relation to real estate, whether it's commercial or residential, um, three of the top key factors that are super important. Location, second one, anybody? Location, third one, anybody? Location, right. Um, most of us have heard that phrase over and over and over. Um, it, and then for a lot of people, it sounds cliche. Um, but there's a gentleman by the name of Howard Samuel who actually coined that phrase in 1944 um, when he founded a company called Land Securities in the United Kingdom. And uh, I think based on everything we're going to go after to talk through today, you're going to realize that location matters. Um, when I when I started to put together all the materials here um, to talk through the seminar, um, I thought about dynamics and what that means. It really means forces or aspects which stimulate growth, development, and change. And then when we talk about analysis, it's kind of the process of breaking a complex topic or substance into smaller parts in order to gain a better understanding of it. So with that in mind, this seminar, we're gonna break down the larger aspects of the real estate market. Um, there's so many little parts um, and you really, you really got to be diligent and do your homework to avoid costly mistakes in this business. Um, we're going to go through, um, this is kind of an outline of what we'll talk through. We're going to go through strategic market planning and site selection. We're going to define a trade area. We're going to talk about tenant categories. We're going to talk about tenant site criteria and customer profiles because as a tenant you want to know how much land do i need you know what what do i need for to have a successful site and we want to know what market do we want to be in where are our customers so we're going to go through a little bit of that know your site requirements know your customers we're going to talk about demographics and infographics we're going to talk about strategic development plans. We will go through um, some of the mobility data um, and how it relates to finding sites, how it relates to understanding your customer, how it can help you um, gauge. If you're adding restaurants, you can do you can take mobility data and do a sales impact study to gauge what potential impact would be. Impact is also, we also call it cannibalization, which is the less attractive term, but impact. We've got a slide that'll define um, shopping center classifications. So everything from a regional mall down to a strip center. Um, we will go through physical site characteristics. And then we're gonna um, we're gonna kind of focus on a, I would say a class A development project that one of our React members, um, Erwin, who is here in this large audience today. Um, <laughs> It's called Topanga Village Plaza. So we've got his development brochure, and we're going to ask Erwin to talk a little bit about the history. How did he get the site? And how did he retended it in this case? And, and where it's at today? So um, I think it'll be a, a great, once we talk through all these different aspects, and then how he got to where he was, but it's a beautiful project. And that's where I would say it's, when we talk about home run location or AAA, it's truly a AAA. Um, We'll talk a little bit about market fluctuations because when we talk about markets being dynamic, I mean, it's not always grow, grow, grow. You're going to have recession, you're going to have issues, you're going to have situations when you're going to, you know, potentially need to close, potentially relocate. Um, you know, what has happened to the industry in the last two years with COVID. Um, so we'll talk through that a bit. 
And um, we do have one slide that hits the bullet points of really what you'd want to go through in a letter of intent. So once you do get your site um, and you, you want to lock it down and you move forward, so it'll show just basically how you define, you know, what you would go through for a letter of intent. And then finally, we've got just a slide on, you know, there are so many different opportunities in what you'd maybe call the shopping center game or the shopping center industry. So just talk through a few, um, you know, generally different types of careers, and then a few network related organizations that you'll have access to. Um, all right, so we'll move to the next slide. All right, well, one of the books I use, there's not a lot of books out there, and as much as I know the business, I wanted to kind of make sure that we're, you know, kind of presenting this in a logical fashion. And I did, um, this is a great little book um, that I, I got off Amazon. I've read it before, but I wanted to have a copy. Some of you might want to look up, but um, I'm actually in touch with the author and I've asked if he may be accessible to student questions as well. But one of the things um, that he quotes or has said in the book that I love is that we're saying that site selection is neither an, a science nor an art, rather it's a combination of both. So I think the way we kind of set it up is that we kind of have a frame, so it looks like art, um, but then inside that you're going to see, you know, an aerial and what we'll talk about here is um, everything that I would say most of the aerials and the demos that we're going to be looking at today are all stemmed from the intersection of Irwin's project um, in Woodland Hills. So, um, you know, to come up with this, you, you come up with a street, strategic market plan and site selection, again, it, it requires a discipline approach. Um, the science piece of it is the stuff that you put your fingers on the numbers, the reports you're going to run, right? It's going to be your GIS system. It's going to be your mapping. It's going to be your demos. Um, it's going to be We'll talk from demos to a whole other category that um, they call tapestry or lifestyle segmentation. Um, your truck accounts, I talked about that. A big part of what we do is um, analyze our competitors. We analyze our competitor location and we really look at their sales volume. And I'll tell you how we get those. Um, we'll talk about mobility data and um, we'll briefly, we'll. Sales forecasting and performers are basically part of what we're saying the science is. So the art, what's the art? Did you have a question? Yeah. Oh, sure. It's in the back, it's on the back page in the reference. On the, oh, so they haven't seen that. So it's called the ABCs of site selection. And will everybody get this deck, I'm assuming? Yeah, so the deck will be distributed after the presentation and, and it is in the reference on the reference page. So talking about the art, what you can't buy. The art is kind of what makes people like me, people like our brokers, people like our, bro our developers that work with our brokers, it makes us important. It's the things that you can't get off of, of from the numbers. It's our history in the market. Um, when I started uh, with Carl's, they didn't have a resource for traffic counts. So as a coordinator, they said, you know, we're thinking about a site, and this is Carl Kircher's son, he's looking at a site in Bermuda Dunes in the desert. And they said, you know, we need you to go out there. We need, need you to sit at the intersection and count cars. So if you count them for half an hour and multiply it out by X, Y, Z. And then we need you to go to every competitor. And we need you to go there, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And we need you to count the cars in the dining room and you need to count the cars in the drive-thru. So we take, you know, and then, this is really embarrassing, but we'd go to the auto club. Does anybody know what the auto club is? <laughs> and we'd get pulled out maps and we'd get different colored dots. So Avery dots, right? McDonald's was yellow, Burger King was orange. And we literally had to plot. That's how we plotted our competitors. And then we would rate, we would estimate the volume and then we would estimate the traffic count. So um so and then you go out there and you you're in the field a lot if you're going to commit this much money to you know deciding on a on a site you're going to want to kick the dirt and there's nothing that 
replaces that. The technology is great back then, but you've got to know your site, you've got to know your immediate trade area, and you've got to know your extended trade area. And there's something called gut instinct, which we kind of coined in your inner computer. Um, you know, I'll have sites that it's like, oh, this site is exactly where I want to be. It's a target trade area, and I want to love it, and I drive out there, and I know physically. <laughs> you kind of know physically if it's a good site. I mean, it's literally your gut instinct. It'd be the same as a home. Like, if you go for a home and it's like, oh, you know, it's only 500,000. Everything else around it is, you know, a million. So let's go look at it. Well, there's probably 10 things wrong with it. Some are fixable. Some aren't. So if, they're, if it's not fixable, you got to walk away or you could get in big trouble. Um, so again, it's the feel of the market outside of analytics. We go into grocery stores and you want to know, you know, what kind of meat are they selling? You know, what kind, what are they, what's on the big displays? I mean, are you seeing heavy Hispanic mix? Are you seeing heavy Asian mix? And whichever it is, you just got to know, is that the right thing for your customer? You know, who you're looking for. So, um, and then the art, and I'd say it's truly an art, is um, really the relationships with the, within the industry. Um, it's the people you work with, your team, you've got to put the site together. And then it's the people that are going to help you find the sites. I mean, I, we didn't talk about the territory that I cover, but I cover, at one point I was covering eight states. Currently I have, I have California, Nevada, Arizona, Alaska, and Hawaii. I live in Southern California. I can't be in all those markets all the time. I need my experts in the field. So I've got my brokers on the ground and you know they know when the shop closes or they're in touch with all the local developers. So I, you know, you really count on your brokers and you count on the developers that, you know, it's like not every deal has to be painful. Let's, you know, we kind of, you come up with maybe a cookie cutter deal where it's like, you know what, we're gonna buy this, you're gonna lease it. And by the way, next time we do one or you find one, call me and I'll do it for you. Um, so you end up, you really count on the relationships to get your own work done, to find the best sites. Um, and eventually they do, they can become friends, um, all depending. And by the way, I think I'm here today because of an industry related relationship. Um, 20 years ago, perhaps, I did a macaroni grill deal in Torrance and the leasing agent for the property was Irwin <laughs> Busey. So, um, it, you know, Norm was lucky to have us, but he didn't make it easy. <laughs> he wanted to uh, redesign a national brand's prototype, which was a lot of fun. But, you know, you get through the deal and the restaurant opens and it knocks it out of the park. And, you know, you hope to do more deals in the future. And we've um, stayed friends ever since. And when he started the real estate um, advisory committee and um, he's like looking for anybody that went to LMU, <laughs> business college or not. Um, so that's why I'm here and I'm enjoying it. So extremely important. All right, so here we're gonna start with, you know, essentially the a definition of a trader. Um, and it can't get any more black and white, I would say than this. Um, you know, it's, it's really a geographical area and it's really, when you look at it, it's, it's as far as you think your customers will drive or walk. Um, and there's really three ways that we've run our um, demos on, on trade areas. Traditionally, it's always been radius, the rain, right? So are my customers gonna drive a mile? Are they gonna drive three miles, five miles? And you can run any variation thereof. Um, these days, you know, rings aren't, completely realistic. So, you know, who's your customer? Well, you know, you could do it again from walk time, depending on the type of site. Um, and here you see that, you know, who, who is the customer? Is it a furniture store? Because that's gonna be a much more destination. So in this example, somebody is gonna jump in the, farm, in the car and they're gonna go a lot farther to go pick up furniture than they are to go get gas on the corner or to go get a burger on the corner. 
Um, so essentially, I mean, you've got this, you can read through it, but when you break it down, um, a geographic or international region where a company transacts business. That's, I would say, where about 70% of your business would come from. And you'd call that a primary trade area. Um, and the rest you'd kind of call it secondary or extended trade areas. Yeah, can you talk about trade barriers? Yes. Why rings don't necessarily fit there? Yes. So I actually have some notes on that, um, just to remind me to talk about it. And we may jump into some other maps that might show this show this better. But again, the old-fashioned days, like the rings don't always make sense. Um, if you think about, okay, think about where we're sitting here today. Um, if I wanted to put a Wendy's at the front gate of LMU, where I just drove in today, um, and the ring is going to pull some pretty amazing demographics. But then what you're going to look at is you're going to, well, that doesn't account for the bluff or the marina or things that, so you're going to have physical uh, barriers that will prevent customers from coming to your site. So people on the other side of the hill, or the other side of the bluff, they're not, not likely gonna trade either uphill or cross a mountain or a river to come to you. There's gonna be psychological trade area barriers where customers, you know, something, you know, may there may be a blighted or, you know, maybe a neighborhood is turned and it's like, well, I wanna go get a burger, but I'm never gonna go through that neighborhood. So there's kind of things that customers are just gonna avoid. Um, and then there's man-made barriers, which, you know, you're going to have a major freeway. And actually, you'll see some of it on the aerial that we go through with Irwin's site is that, um, you know, you see less of a dip of people coming on the opposite side of the 101 freeway, which is a lot of traffic, you know, there's a lot of traffic. So man-made barriers being, you know, um, freeways, railroad tracks, that type of thing. So, yes. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about tenant categories. And we're going to just throw in a little lingo, talk a little bit about tenant mix. Why do some tenants want to be with some tenants and there's the synergy? Why uh, some tenants will say, I'll be in your center, but you cannot let so and so and so and so, no direct competition in the same shopping center. Um, and this is pretty intuitive, but just the way we talk about essentially shopping centers. You've got big box anchor tenants that are your big draw, um, your big traffic generator. So you go from like an upscale department store, your Nordstrom's, Bloomingdale's, Saks, and you can you get to your little more value oriented with Kohl's, JCPenney's, um, and then off price channels, which are your Rosses and your Burlington's, your TJ Maxx, TJ Maxx has home goods and Marshalls. Um, your hypermarkets, um, super centers, which are your Walmarts and Targets, um, your warehouse or clubs, your Costco's and Sam's, your home improvement, your Home Depot and Lowe's, your grocery anchors. Um, and just maybe to stop and pause about those type of anchors. Like, you know, there's when we get a little down on this list, you talk about, you know, I. I like to be where more customers are coming to a shopping center. So a fast a food user is going to say, hey, look, the more trips that are coming to this shopping center, the better for me. Um, so uh, a grocery store would be considered a daily needs, um, essentially. So we like customers coming frequently. We used to think that we wanted to be on the big box Costco. But the fact of the matter is, um, People are coming to Costco, and I'm sure everybody's shopped at Costco. People are coming to Costco, they're going in, they're eating their whole way through, they're loading up on frozen goods and perishables, and they're leaving, and they're not gonna be in the mood to go through a drive through for a burger, for the most part. They're getting their buck 50 hot dog and soda for, I don't even know what they sell for. So, um, so we have to be really careful who we co-tenant with. Uh, um, then you're going to have, you know, your drugstores, uh, you're going to have um, your entertainment anchors, 
Um, and we'll talk a little bit too about um, the fact that if I'm going to be in a shopping center and I, I want traffic coming from big anchors, but at the same time, I don't want to ever lose the traffic from a primary street. Um, I don't want to, because if something happens, if my anchor goes dark, um, for instance, if I was on an AMC and that was all I had behind me, and if it was up on a hill, well, if COVID hit or something happened or if they went dark because another competitor came in down the street, I'm out of luck, right? Because there's not cars coming to that shopping center. So you've always got to be really cautious that you're looking for a combination of, of generators. And we'll talk about that further in the, in the deck, um, but you've got to be really cautious that you're not counting on just one, one anchor tent. Um, and then to get a little deeper on that subject, you can, you try to negotiate, you know, if an anchor goes dark, well, maybe your rent goes down. Well, that's, you know, in many cases still doesn't matter because it won't make up for the lost sale. Um, so then you've got a variety of entertainment anchors. Um, your movie theaters, top golf, Dave Buster types, your fitness centers, your wellness tenants, your specialty, Amazon and the Ulta's and the Sephora's. You've got your white tablecloth, um, high end restaurants, um, your casual dining. Um, casual dining, you'd say, is, is still when. You know, somebody comes to your table and gives you order, um, but you don't have to get dressed up to go there. It's kind of the best way to describe it. And then your fast schedule, which you're familiar with, the Panera's, the Shake Shacks, the Mendo Farms, where you order and sit down. Um, and then the family of restaurants that I'm in, um, we like to call ourselves quick service restaurants, but basically we're fast food. Um, and that's kind of your in and out, your Chick fil A's, your Wendy's, your Couple Bells your coffees, your convenience stores, gas station, financial. So these are all variations of different retail tenants that if you're out there finding property or if you decide you want to go work for one of these tenants, you know, what I have down here is that any of these national or regional chains that intend to grow, that intend to build their brand, you know, they're going to have a team of experts in house. As I mentioned, we've got a team of 150. Um, so it's a combination of, you know, the people out in front, which is on the real estate side, your backup, which is your construction team, your design team, your architects, your legal team, et cetera. A lot of companies these days um, maybe don't want to hire a whole team like that in house. So there's a lot of uh, different firms. JLL is the one that comes to top of mind. Um, I have a girlfriend who does all of T-Mobile's work for a certain territory. So she finds site for T-Mobile, but they don't want, they have a skeleton team in-house and, um, and my girlfriend works, well, it was JLL, now it's CBRE. And so basically that big brokerage company takes on the role of a real estate department for the company. Does anybody have any questions? Nope. I need some questions. Yeah, I, thank you. Sales forecasting and, and then that internal, or do you use external groups to come up with sales? We use internal. And um, we typically use, uh, we'll go with like a like for like. So we look at this site is a neighborhood grocery shopping center and it feels like if you're looking at site in Torrance, maybe it looks like the site in Burbank. Well, Burbank's a power center. And so you kind of like pros and cons and compare volumes. Um, typically our operations group, um, they used to take real estate's uh, estimate on it, but they kind of discounted our, which you kind of don't want to really get the trap of being on the real estate side and giving the sales estimate. Um, it depends how companies decide to bond with you, but um, you know, you're, you're presenting a site and you're presenting it for its merits and you believe it's going to be a successful site, but um, we never want to be perceived as, you know, pushing a site for any one reason or another. What I do, Wendy's really transitioned in the last 10 years, I'd say, to, um, we're more majority franchise operated. So my entire market is franchisees. So I'm really finding sites, any franchisee that wants, wants a site, I either present or I have, I have to approve every site. But in that case, 
I don't give a sales work sales work test. We can't because if um, if if they if I said if if I give them a sales forecast, say I give them a four million dollars sales forecast, and they opened up and they were doing two million, they're going to turn around and sue the company and say, well, as an earnings claim, Kathy said, or you know, so basically they made their projections based on what I told them. So we're really careful with franchise relations and what we tell them. It's only been within maybe the last five years that we've been able to share with them competitive audits. And we have like a little legal disclaimer. And I'll tell you, I'll show you a competitive report and um, that and where we get that information from. So yes. Oh, sure. Okay, yes. I'll repeat it next time. That last one was on sales forecasting. So hopefully, yes. Um, for the landowner, is it the funding company or the franchise? So that the, so the question was, um, with our properties, is it a Wendy's deal or is it a franchise operator? And that's, go to the head of the class right there um, because <laughs> um, people would want Wendy's on the lease. Um, but for the most part, what I'm doing, it's the franchisee on the lease. Um, number one, most of our franchisees like to buy. It's very rare in hot markets that we're able to go out and buy properties. Um, but um, most of our franchisees have great networks. So, but if I'm going to a, a center and there's pads that I'm competing, um, number one, we have an in and out set criteria here. So if in and out steps up, steps up, I kind of step aside. <laughs> Typically, if Chick fil A steps up, I step aside. Um, or we can co-tenant with Chick-fil-A. We battle that out, whole another discussion. But um, there are cases, and we have some smaller franchisees that number one, have either not developed ever or need help. So we have a program within our company and they can pay us money. We call it a RIP program, real estate procurement program. And in that case, they pay us and I find the site. I negotiate the letter of intent. Wendy's is on the lease, Wendy's Properties LLC, which is about... Oh, about an eight hundred million dollar net worth in that group. So landlords love to see that, and that way our franchisee can compete against some, you know, the Carls or the Taco Bells or et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but that's a great question on who you're know who you're getting on your lease, right? So this is the first time you know I created this deck. It's a big story to tell, um, and actually, there's things like that that I would maybe note that I could expand on in the future. So thank you for asking that. Um, and I'm gonna, um, I mean, what I did is to, to help you get a picture of, of who's, you know, what, what tenants look for. And if you're out looking to buy a piece of property, you know, you can pretty much pull from the internet. Not everybody has it readily available. Again, if you go to these, if you go to these conventions, um, literally tenants are there like, bring us deals. <laughs> We have stacks of here's our criteria. Um, and if you come up and you say, I have a site at Maine and Maine, we're going to want to talk. If you have a site at Y and Z and it's off corner over here, we're going to say, like, well, let's talk through a bit. Here's why it might not work. So, this really, you know, you can grab. We have people that have suitcases, some roller suitcases that go around the convention. And, and I actually send out our site criteria probably every day about a half dozen times at least, people looking to say, can we do Wendy's here on our property? So I didn't wanna, there will be Wendy's materials, but I didn't wanna like drown you with Wendy's materials. So pulled um, Panera Bread and um, I thought they did a nice job. You get an idea of a rendering of their building. And then um, you'll have a clearer picture of this when you get the deck, I think. If not, you can, I pulled it off the internet in this case, um, but they've got a great breakdown of what they're looking. They're looking at one and two miles and they're showing, you know, their, pup, their what is their residential population? And that's different than their daytime population. Daytime population is people that are working in the, in the market or people that have not left during the day to work elsewhere. Um, and they're looking at a median income range and uh, an education level and traffic counts. And then they do a nice job of listing their preferred co-tenants. So if you see, they like big box, they like regional retail. Um, 
they like prominent shopping centers, um, like being around colleges. Um, so, and then they do, they also included a little bit of what they expect as far as their site requirements, because most, most of the time you're going to build Panera a shell, a shell meaning you're building the building, they'll come and build the interior out. Um, so the parameters of that, um, space parameter, pretty detailed, um, and then the deal types that they like. So you go, you can get, you know, you can really research your tenants and get a really good feel of where they're going to want to make a deal or where they can make a deal. Um, I actually talked to my friend at in and out who I've known for 25 years, and um, Irwin just didn't deal with him, right? Yes. Rancho Mirage or? No. Mm -hmm. And I had pulled something off the internet that was ancient, and I said, I asked him for something a little better. He actually sent me this icon on your project, because I talked about wanting to have something tie into talking about a project, but I like your your project in the hills is for this class at least, but so they don't need to say much because they're a highly desired tenant. Um, they, when we talk about quick service and like gas stations and um, they're typically, you know, they need kind of convenient locations. People like driving and they didn't necessarily think, you know, I want a burger, but it's like, oh God, in and out. They want a quick, easy in and out, literally. Um, they used to take sites that were like, way off the intersection and, you know, just not great sites. They're really big on buying their properties. And so when they started their company, they went out and they just bought properties off interchanges and just random properties all over and they could build and people come. Most, most restaurants can't do that, but they kind of polished their strategy because now you've got developers rolling out the red carpet for them. And if they can fit them, like I don't stand a chance <laughs> trying to get a pad when in and out wants to be at the center. Um, they, you know, when you look at, they need the heavy, heavy traffic site. Um, same, similar, what you're looking at as far as the population, median income range. Um, their lot size is huge. They've got to have 50,000 square feet. Um, so an acre is 43,560 square feet. So you need more than an acre to accommodate an in and out. And beyond that, if they're in your center, I mean, you've seen their lines. We've all waited in, in and out lines, right? So it can get crazy. And then cities are onto it too. So they can't just take any stuff. They have to really ahead of time plan out. So for a developer to put an in and out their shopping center, you really have to be able to have the size to accommodate it. So um, they love to buy their properties, but they will lease. Yes. Is there a way to make those lines just a little bit bigger? Um, Pull, pull, pass out the deck. Okay. Next, next, add their spring break. Okay, sorry. No um, you know what? I have one that you can look at now if you want. Okay. And if I pull it back from you, then. <laughs> Start from there. Thank you. Sure. Um, and yeah, this, this one was not off the internet. This one emailed me. You're going to. Have my contact information so beyond the deck if there's anything that you want more information on feel free to reach out um and only to my favorite tenant um so this is emailable i know this didn't come up very clear either but you know we're originally the first um guy i worked for he's like you know it's not too hard to figure out like dave thomas simple guy used to say well it's not rocket surgery um, <laughs> literally. Yeah. So, you know, we'd say, you know, we know to have a successful restaurant, we need a solid residential base. We need daytime employment and we need retail energy. And so we kind of looked at it as like a three legged stool. And if one of those legs is not there, you're not going to have the same sales volume that you thought you might have. That's changed a bit because we've gotten way more creative on the types of sites that we'll do. When I say that we're at 6,800. A year ago, we were trying to get to 8,000. And within this last year, that 8,000 went to 8,500. We have a, a new franchisee that's a landholder called Reef. And they're a franchisee now. They're in Canada. And they have 
I want to say 900 targeted trade areas. And what they are is they're just they're just a truck. They're a trailer. They're delivery only. So the ones I they'll they'll start popping up around LA. Um, they're in Canada. They're in Dallas now. They're in Arizona. They're coming to LA real quick. Um, but they've got properties everywhere. Like, what do we do with this extra property? You know, we will pop a trailer on there and we'll turn you know turn on our Uber. You know, and have and so it's delivery only and. Um, you know, they're not going to do traditional sales volumes of the full, you know, our average in LA is about 2.1. So they're not going to do that, but it's another point where we're getting our food out, which is excellent. Um, so as you go across the top, we're doing little frosty carts in zoos and kind of entertainment venues. Um, we're looking at drive through onlys. We're looking at a whole variation. And you know, we like it, it's just very, very helpful to give your developers and or brokers something that they know, you know, basically they know the parameters. And then we include kind of our real estate director math um, to make sure that everybody knows who to contact. Doesn't always work, but um, but that's what we do. So here's a snapshot of our demo report. And again. You know, just the basics is what we look for. But when you talk about the GIS system, and we work with Esri, I think LMU actually works with Esri too. There's a contact here that has this. I don't know that you use it for what we do, but we've worked with them, and you create your custom reports based on on your customer profile. So, again, so I'm sorry, radius rings, drive time or walk time, and I pull probably 20 of these a day. It's like, what do you think? Do you want to play with it? And it's if I'm looking at something in downtown LA, I'm pulling a walk time. Um, and again, when we're talking about what's more applicable, the rings aren't as applicable as a drive time. Um, this is based off the intersection of um, the Woodland Hills. It's Topanga and Irwin, coincidentally. Um, so we look at when I'm doing a write up or making a recommendation, I'm just pulling the one and two miles in 2021. And we project out the growth, and I'm looking at the median household income in one and two miles, and I'm looking at the take time population workers. So, who, what, where's my lunch? That's what I'm looking at. And then um, we've got a business report that I love, and there's multiple variations of any of these that you can run. But to me, I'm like talking to my franchisees or my marketing people, it's like, here's who you need to talk to or who you need to market to, because this is telling me REI is. A tenth of a mile away, and they have 60 employees, or better yet, farmers group, uh, three tenths of a mile away, or whatever it is, 1500 employees. So it really gives you a great snapshot into who's who's working, who's there for lunch in your immediate trader. And then our competitor report. So in, on our side of the business, we were not allowed to tell franchisees what our competition did. I mean, I would be on site rides and I'd have the report and I would know what they did. Um, and the franchisees would try to talk me into telling them, but I'd get in big trouble if I did. Um, but now it's public knowledge because it's, uh, we subscribe to something called restaurant trends. And this is um, based on what the certain competitors subscribe to it. So, we tell them sales and then they do surveys to kind of do some verification. We never get in and out sales because in and out doesn't, they're privately held and they don't participate. But we have friends that you can try to get that information from. Again, relationships, because it's, you know, some people on the inside of the company or people that have worked with them and you get a feel of what they do. Um, um, what I like about this report is it tells you, okay, so, the McDonald's, it's got the address, it's got their sales, and um, on the right, right of the sales is their DMA average, right? So LA um, is Los Angeles, Orange County, San Bernardino Riverside, and Ventura counties, about 18 and a half million people. Um, their average in LA is 3.8. So what I'm looking at that intersection, I'm seeing what they're doing there, I'm like, holy Toledo. Now, Irwin site was an offer to me, <laughs> but in fact, the matter is we're too close and we wouldn't be able to do it, but um, I don't think you have any directories out there. I don't take it personally. Um, 
It also shows you how many um, they have in the DMA. Um, so they have 527 in the LA DMA. And it goes down the list. We truck Panera, in and out talk about Jack, Chick. Um, look at what the Chick-fil-A is doing in that market. Doing $9 million. So when you talk about if you're competing for a site or a pad, so it's like, I know my threshold on rent because I know my sales average. And I'm probably not going to take a site unless I know it's going to do better than average. But I'm certainly not going to be doing, I hope and pray that I'd be doing almost $10 million at one point, but um, they're on fire. They and um, Raising Cane's, by the way, in this market are really, really aggressive with sites um, and can pay a lot of money. So uh, because this is reported on something called Restaurant Trends, um, and we have a legal disclaimer, I am able to share that with my franchisees. And this is just um, kind of a visual um, map of the competition. And one of the tools that I have that I love is that I've got an app that I can pull. I can, I can pull these maps when I'm in the field and I can pull if we're driving. Like, so what's that, you know, Jack doing over there? Or what's that? So this is an amazing, again, back in the day, didn't have it but um, love having it when you're active in the field. Um, Esri provided a few reports for us that are based on the intersection of Topanga and Irwin, where the development is. Um, this happens to be a 3.3 minute drive time. And they provided a link that will be on the last sheet of the deck. But you can actually, jump into this and um, you can, after class, after the seminar, on your spring break, because this is so much fun, you can go into the site and it'll tell you a, bit, a little bit about, um, you can see that the area in yellow is 5,000 people and they call it a polygon. Again, not a ring, right? 15,000 people in the orange polygon and 25,000 people in the green polygon. And I can tell you that um, the site, at Topanga and Irwin is pulling from a lot farther than 3.3 miles. So there, um, but anyway, this again goes to the competitive map. And uh, my census track. But here's kind of what's fun that you might want to play with over spring break is if you, you can kind of tap, you know, they're going into the breakdown of um, how many, you know, it's going to break out your educational um group and you know the percentages of high school to bachelors you're going to be able to kind of look visually and really you know the, dif the difference between a demographic report which i showed you with all the numbers and the infographic report is really visual the infographics is just visual but this what what these guys have what these companies because esri is not the only company that does this type of thing um what the information that you can pull to get information on your trade area is literally endless. You could look at it from so many different directions. Um, but I thought that would be very interesting for you all. And again, you have the link. I think it's just on that demographic, yeah, on the demographic or infographic page. In the trade area that we're looking at, I might hold it back up a little more. In this trade area, let's see. Oh yeah, we're going to jump down to tapestry segmentation. Um, so this classifies neighborhoods into 67 different segments. Um, and so the difference between demographics and this tapestry segmentation is that instead of strict census numbers, strict numbers and stats, they're pulling lifestyles, behaviors, and spending patterns. So when we when we jump down to this this beautiful slide here, it's going to be more of the same. They're going to talk from um, everything from now. I have three slides that actually describe the enterprising professionals. There's 46 percent of this defined trade area is enterprising professionals, and I've got a, a few slides that show the definition of that, which will be in your deck. 
I pulled in talking to the Ezra people, the 67 descriptions, it's a hundred page PDF that you can pull off the internet. And it goes into so much detail on every type of customer and the names of the different categories. I think they work with, or maybe they're related to the Ben and Jerry's people. <laughs> I think Ben and Jerry's has like 98 different flavors. I mean, cause how much fun did they come up, you know, with like, when you look through the different names, I mean, it's midtown singles or sprouting explorers. It, it just goes on and on. And I was talking to one of our real estate uh, VPs in one of our franchise organizations. And she was telling me about a site in Southwest Vegas, one of the only cities in Vegas that I think prostitution is still legal. And it's a big city. They have a Walmart. So I, we should have a Wendy's up there. And she's like, well, I know it's nothing but like, what'd she call it? Millionaires and meth heads. I'm like, <laughs> are you working with Esri on <laughs> the descriptions of these straight areas? Because I mean, it's, it's so it's somewhat intuitive. But again, it really boils down into, well, let me get into the next slide because it'll tell you how deep they look. Um, who are we along descriptions? I mean, um, and it gets into, so this is national. Uh, this is not to the site, but it gets into, you know, the neighborhood, you know, where they like to eat, what they like to buy. They like to buy, you know, ebooks. And yeah. so it just goes on and on. And it's, so it really is fascinating. Um, but too much in depth to really go through in this seminar. Um, but if anybody wants more information, again, I can either email you the PDF or uh, feel free to download it on your own. So when we talk, start talking about using these maps and starting to come up with a strategy, um, I pulled, Esri pulled something similar, but to me it wasn't um, you couldn't really read the map very well, but this is a little more, I think will be easier to talk through. So for the entire country, we've, we've identified PTAs, potential trade areas or priority trade areas. And in every one of those, it's really, so we take all of the GIS information. We say, okay, where do we not have a Wendy's? Where do our competitors have Wendy's? And then it'll rate, it, it came out with a different shading program that if McDonald's did, is above its average, it's going to be a green. If it's at average, it's going to be a yellow. And then if it's below average, it's going to be a red. Well, we started with that. And then each real estate director um, really went into their whole entire market and we vetted every single trade area. So I know where my Wendy's are and in this map, and I can, again, this is what I can pull on my app when I'm in the field, which is awesome. Um, I can click on the Wendy's head. We call it a cameo. Um, it'll tell me the address, the sales, the franchisee, how long it's been open. Um, and then I go click onto each of these. The fact that the rings have a red circle around it means that it's been vetted. So as, real, as a real estate team, we go in and we, we don't necessarily drive every one of them because we most of us know our markets well enough, but, um, but it is a challenge to get to all of them. We go in and we we kind of recommend um, you know we would we rate the the trade area, give it a category. So inside those, you click a box that's got all this information as far as our strategic plan. So um, it it we tell we also make a recommendation of um, who our preferred franchisee would be. So there's like a list of who that might go to, and I believe there's many other companies that use something similar, but it's a great way. Kind of to, to develop a, a really detailed strategy. Does anybody have any questions on this? No? Yeah. I got a sure. So, store count in your trade area, like, how many square feet does it take you in your trade area to do that? See, it's so, you know, it's kind of endless um, in the sense that. How do you slide that? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I'll tell you right now, I have a slide that works back. You know, I came, I came to Winnie Bookie Dome and we were pretty far behind the ball out west. Um, and this is in the deck, obviously, but when you look at a market, um, I think we might have had 30 restaurants at the time. Um, and this is in LA, just in, just in LA. 
you know, we're talking currently we have 130. Well, and I mentioned briefly before, so the population in LA is 18,521. So I have one Wendy's for um, 100, every 142,000 people. McDonald's has 525 to our 130, right? So they have one restaurant for every 34,000. Jack, um, because they're Southern California based, they're really well penetrated. They have 475 to our 130. Um, um, I have like a little thing. We have 130 currently <laughs> because it's almost like we will do as many as we can do, as many as can make sense. But you know, to get one quality site, you're working on the minimum five quality sites because, or five sites that you hope come together because it's really aggressive out there, competitively, availability wise, and affordability wise. Um, Carl's, because they're Southern California based, based out of Anaheim, and so they've been in Southern California a long time. Um, they have uh, 349, for, so that's one for every 50,000. Taco Bell, 329, one for about every 56,000. And um, Chick fil A is growing pretty aggressively because they haven't been out here freestanding for a long time. Um, they have uh, 79 for uh, every 234. So they've got, they also have some catch up too. Um, but when we get to this slide, and now we'll just whiz through it, but um, when this, this is, uh, it, it's showing that McDonald's is the number one um, in QSR as far as the number of units. Starbucks is, it's uh, nationwide, McDonald's has 40,500 nationwide. Starbucks already has 18,750, and they've been around since the 70s. McDonald's has been around forever since the 30s. Yeah, so, in my planet, I've got a goal and I have a stretch goal. And I'm doing, I'm doing about 25 deals a year in my territory, but if I brought more, I'd be a hero. So I, we're aggressive. Any other questions on this map? All right. So now we talk a little bit about mobility data. And it's kind of a long description, but it's, pretty fascinating. Um, it really helps us in defining and finding out where our customers are. So they literally use trillions of data points worldwide to determine trip patterns, points of origin. Um, they source them directly and anonymously from customers that have their mobile devices on. So we know it's very accurate. Um, they uh, we know they've been in the restaurant and it really tracks them to within 10 feet of accuracy over a 12 month period. So it kind of helps show where they are, where they came from and where they're working. And so you can kind of deduce, you know, if they're coming from a neighborhood, they're probably coming from home. If they're going to Warner Center, they're probably going to work. Um, so we, um, this is all coded to census blocks and then assigned to a potential trade area, which is where the dot lies. So I have another function where I can turn on in that same map our PTAs for each restaurant. So when I turn on that former map with all our Wendy's heads, it'll show blobs. I think we may have a slide that speaks to it, but, it, but I know where my customers are coming from and I know what type of customer they are. Um, this really is valuable when we look at, are we gonna build another restaurant two miles away or three miles away? And it really, I have my work cut out for me because in Southern California, there's probably eight franchisees. Two of our bigger franchisees have their own real estate vice presidents in-house and they've got their own brokerage teams and they're out there looking. So when they're looking for a site, I have to approve, they have to register a site, which we call a real estate letter. And then if they want approval for the site, it's a whole other, it's an NRR approval. But if they're in close proximity to another Wendy's, we typically will have to do an impact study. So if we see that a restaurant's going to impact perhaps 10% um, or less, we're saying probably a good, you know, good enough to go. But if it's over double digits, we're typically saying, unless it's the, the, their own franchisee, their own group, we're probably not, not going to let somebody else come and take that business away from them. 
Anybody have any questions on mobility data? Anybody want to turn off their phones when they're out shopping? <laughs> we are being tracked by Big Brother for sure. Um, all right. So this is um, something that um, you can get it off by CSC, but it's a really great description of the types of shopping shopping centers. So it goes from a description, again, from like super regional to regional, all the way down to a theme or a factory outlet or lifestyle. Um, it, it gives a description of the concept, the typical uh, GLA, which is the gross leasable area. Um, and then the gross leasable area is different than the land because the leasable area is shop space. And then you got to have your parking and common area. So that is your the number of acres. To um, and then typical number of tenants, typical types of acres, and typical trade area size. So I just thought this would be a really valuable tool to have in your reference book as you're, you know, looking towards, um, you know, what type of shopping center, how much land are you going to need to, you know, land that type of center, plan that type of center. This is um, back in the day, they used to, Steve Soberoff, um, uh, you had created a seminar similar to this, but he called it the shopping center game. And these architects came up, this it's such a bad slide because it's a picture of a picture of a copy of it because it's so old, but um, it's kind of fun because we say, well, this is what a typical shopping center would look like. And by the way, that shopping center plan looks almost like the plan we're going to look at in Irwin's, <laughs> in Irwin's deck. I mean, that's a nice, responsible, great shopping center. And this is done probably 25 years ago, right? Um, then they say, well, this is a, on the right, we're going to see this is a shopping center that a major tenant, that's their vision of what a shopping center is. So what, what is it? It's they get the big box, they get all access aisles going to straight to them <laughs> and they get all the parking. And, um, one little pad out on the corner with a few trees just around that pad. Um, and then you get the shopping center seen by a developer. Now that's a greedy developer, not a realistic developer, right? <laughs> so here you got pad, 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 interior pads, which are the kiss of death, by the way. Um, and so again, and then you get the shopping center as seen by the city, which basically looks like a park, right? Because they don't want to see shopping centers necessarily. They want to look like their city central park and you know beautification of the city. So I had to show that one because it just is a classic. Um, so when we're out looking for properties, um, there's some really important factors to consider. And um, when we're talking about, you know, first of all, when you're building your shopper, shopping center, you know, what I, I just kind of listed again, some of the types of tenants. You've got your anchor tenant, big box, the shop space. And I'll point it out when we go through the shopping center again, but you've got inline space, you've got in cap space, you've got freestanding paths, and you've got shared pads that are multi tenant, where it's like you're going to be out in the parking lot with the pads that's going to have a combination of Starbucks and your Jersey mics and your bank and et cetera. So that's called a multi tenant pad. Um, so if you're not looking in a shopping center, you're, you're typically looking for a freestanding property, which we love those as well, as long as you can get enough land for your parking. Um, are you on a hard corner, which kind of describes itself, you get the hard corner. Um, are you on a near corner or far corner? So a near corner is when you're coming to the intersection, and this is my stoplight, you're the corner on the near side of, of the intersection. The far corner is going to be on the other side of the intersection. Which is typically a pretty desirable corner because you may have got to this intersection. It's like, well, oh, can't get in there anymore, but look, I can get to that one if I go right through and make a right. So near and far corner. And then we have off corner, which kind of self explanatory, but can't always get the corner. It's hard to get the corners. Um, and then you've got mid block where you're not even close to the corner, but, but you know, depending on the trade area, it might work. So some things that we factor into when we're looking in these trade areas is what's the focal point of the business? You know, where's everything happening? Um, when you have a focal point, 
it's typically hard to get a piece of an available piece of real estate in that focal point. But you know, so where is this energy? Um, are you looking at a signalized intersection? Because it's for us really important. You want to be able to stop the traffic. Um, and then it, it may be a stop sign in some of these small towns, rural markets, but will it be a future signal? Um, can you can you turn left into the site? Or at the signal, is there, there a protected left arrow? These are all things that, you know, we have lists. Call it a scorecard, call it just a kind of like, you're making sure that you're checking off all of this information. So when you're presenting it, maybe to your senior management or to the owners that are investing with you, you want to have answers to all of these things. Um, if, you're at a, if you're at an intersection, can they make it? Um, and you look, I mean, if it's not posted, typically you can, but you've got to keep an eye out for that. You also want to be talking to the city. Like, you know, is there currently a median in the, set, in the, in the middle of the street? If there's a lot of traffic, if there's not a median now, there probably will be in the future. So you've got to think about, you know, access. Um, and then we think about, are you on the going to work side, which is typically where Starbucks or uh, Dutch, well, Dutch, Dutch Brothers is our next in and out. They don't care where they go because people are coming. Do you guys all, have you been to Dutch Brothers? Oh, in LA, they're, they're coming. Um, they're amazing. Drive through coffee. Um, so are you on the going to work side or the going home side? Um, again, is left turn in allowed? Um, you want to be able to have your customers be able to turn into you. So is it a protected left, which would be maybe there's a median with a, a real turn pocket, or then there's something we call a suicide lane. That's when it's kind of a center median, but there's no concrete or cement. So then technically it's legal for either direction to pull into that middle section. So we call it suicide lane because you both have the right of way. So there's not any direction there. So those work, but you gotta be cautious of those as well. Um, and so here's some things that just kind of outlining and highlighting really important. And you really wanna make sure you're crossing the T's and dotting the I's when you're analyzing your access. So we hit upon a lot of those points, but really how easily can you get on the property? And as importantly, can they get off the property? and go the direction you think they're, they're needing to head. Um, because sometimes if you can get people on the property, but you're not getting them off, they may come to you once or twice, but they're not gonna come back because they're gonna say, you know what? I'm not gonna mess with it. I've been to this gas station, got gas, but I couldn't get back to where I was going. So I'm gonna go to the next, you know, more convenient gas station or retailer or whatever tenant it might be. Um, you've got to remember, you've got to really, really understand on and off access points, and then if you're part of a shopping center, that typically helps because you, you end up um, working with kind of cross flow, cross access easements. Um, so you wanna check that out. And then visibility is really important. Can they see you? Um, are there any impairments? We take a lot, a lot of time analyzing that from every different direction. And you know what, sometimes you, you've got a great corner but then you're going into the city and they're going to approve your plans and they're going to say, you know what, but there's a landscape program that you've got to adhere to. Phoenix is the worst because they have these trees that grow like horrible. Um, so you've got to make sure that you not only have good visibility today, but that you can protect your visibility in the future. Um, skinny palm trees are good. <laughs> they go really high and you've got a line of sight, but you've got to be really cautious of that because that sticks in people's brains. Um, Parking is extremely important. Um, we call adjacent parking the, the spots that are adjacent to the building um, and convenient parking. We'll touch on this a little bit as we go through the deck, but you know now um, convenient parking and now we're having to carve out spaces for like Uber, Uber Eats and all the delivery platforms um, because if they're gonna, you know, if people are ordering from you, you want your drivers to have easy access. If you want them to be able to park and, and actually we're having to build extra counter space for just that kind of pickup, right? So they can easily come in and out. Because if they get an order and they're like, oh, I've been over to that Chipotle or I've been over to that Panera and it's a pain, they're gonna like, eh, go to the next one, you know? They, it, so you've gotta make sure that you're making it, it extremely convenient um, for the parking and pickup. Signage um, kind of goes without saying, the more the better. Um, Always maximize it out. Cities are tough on it. Developers are tough on it. 
but um, you got to work with it, right? Because in a center, they only get so much. You're looking at your building. How many sides of the building do you get? And um, you, you know, your freestanding sign and are you on a shared shopping center sign? How much you can get? Who's paying for it? You know, how you contribute, et cetera. So signage is critical. Um, and then, you know, easements are important to identify. Um, there's public utility easements and there's private access easements. And then one thing when we're in a shopping center that we look at, um, once you negotiate, you know, your pad and you, you know where your parking is and you know where the common access drives are, we're gonna highlight an area that we're gonna say, well, this is our protected area. So if you come in and you wanna add a pad or you wanna change an access drive, we've already identified that you can't change anything in this defined protected area. So that's something you've hit in your letter of intent. So how are we doing on time? Do we take a quick break now, or um, do you want to? I want to ask two questions. Sure. Um, can you walk through your your, your the deal that you're proudest of, and also a deal where you're like, oh my god, I can't believe I got this one. Well, you know what? I have interviewed a few candidates in the last year and I asked them that question and then I went what color would I answer um so it's hard to say um I have lots that I'm proud of um especially like bring, you know doing the sit down dinner houses was a ton of fun and we were treated like royalty because literally the red carpets rolled out for you we did like deals with Caruso like Machiano's at the farmer's market and um people really want to have you in their center so doing quick service restaurant deals are a lot tougher. People don't always want drive throughs um, And we work with a lot of franchisees, um, but um, not all of them have the expertise in um, doing their, you know, developing. So when I, one of the ones I'm most proud of in LA, since we're kind of here in LA, um, we have a, a small store operator. He's actually got Woodland Hills. Um, and Kevin Berry is a broker that I've worked with um, for years, and uh, when we had company markets, he worked for us, and then I recommended to him to our franchisees when uh, we went all franchise, and so he's doing a lot of deals with them, um, so it helps me with him getting deals done, but this Ron Ross, who has been the, the head of our DMA group, as long as I've been with the company, just a wonderful guy, um, we found a, a site in Southgate for him, and it was a Burger King conversion, and it was a huge shopping center, um, but the Burger King was at the signalized entry and, um, it was, that was a single owner aside from the rest of the shopping center. So, um, ton of density, ton of retail, ton of daytime at a signalized entry, converted the Burger King, um, opened it up and he's doing more than double our average. So he's happy. He and his wife are very, very happy. So. It's a pleasure to be able to help our franchisees grow like that. Um, one of the ones that <laughs> you could tell your partner I regret, um, way back in the day, um, out in Rancho Cucamonga was a growing area and there was a huge mall that Forest City built, right? Right off the 15 freeway. I mean, it is landmark, boom, home run. And I think it, Mark was with Regency at the time developing the parcel next across the street. We were working with Mark. McDonald's had the, the pad on the point at, with Forest City. Well, we came to a deal point with Mark that was a hurdle. They didn't, at the time, this leasing person didn't want to give us any contingencies. So we, we can't move forward unless we know in our lease, we have the time to get our permits. Because if we can't get a permit to operate a drive-through, we can't do business. So we, we were at a stumbling point there. And um, who's the Rodney Dangerfield at Forest City? Um, the leasing guy. Um, anyway, he's like, McDonald's blew out of their deal at the mall. We want it. So then it was a tough one because Mark and Mark's like, we'll, get, you know, we'll do what you need us to do. By then, our company's like, you know, we've got stars in our eyes. We're getting a McDonald's deal. It's in front of a regional mall, off a of freeway, Foothill Boulevard, all the traffic in the world. So we open up and we're doing pretty good. 
Well, then there's so much traffic. The developer puts a median in, in, in the shopping center. So they can't turn into what was originally our left turn in. And the city obviously put up a bigger median. So the access to the site just got worse and worse and worse. And our sales went down, down, down. And it was a company market restaurant at the time. And our, some of our company people are known to give up sooner than maybe some of our franchise operators. So guess who's there now operating? McDonald's. <laughs> we had to get rid of it. So that was a huge lesson learned. It was one of those that, so when, when we get company deals approved, we have to have everybody from the senior VP of operations back in Ohio, we have to have, um, we have marketing, we have operations, we have real estate, and we site tour and we package and we show all the pros and cons and we get the buy-in for the whole, from the whole team. So um, it's not like I'm out there making the decision on my own. Every single one of us said we would have still made that same decision because it just appears to be a home run location. But um, when you go back and if you went and did all the things, they made us do a special building. So it didn't look like a Wendy's. So we didn't have the recognition. We had minimal signage. We had horrible access. All the traffic in the world you want, all the residential and all the retail, but you couldn't get to us and you couldn't get off our property. So that one's painful, <laughs> but McDonald's is making it work though. So go figure that one out, right? So anybody else have any questions before we break? Are we, okay. We're gonna take a what, five, 10? Or do we wanna take a break? I'm ready to go through. If we wanna go straight through so everybody can let's take a five minute break. Okay. Okay. Everybody? Everyone, are you ready to? Yeah. If you don't mind re-asking some of those questions that we were talking about, at, you know, maybe at some point as we go through, because um, they're all great, great questions as far as, you know, competitors kind of come into the market. Um, but I thought if we've covered a lot as far as information about markets and, um, you know, how do you land on real estate? I mean, ideally it'd be great for, you know, to be able to say, well, I know there's a lot of people there and there's a lot of traffic there and I want to be right at that intersection. Well, typically in a state like California or a DMA like Los Angeles, you're not going to find available property. So you got to, you know, we count a lot on our brokers and we're out there digging and digging to find available properties. Um, often you're going to, maybe the only way you're going to get into the market is through a conversion. Um, and then maybe some ways that you're going to buy a shopping center is by buying a dilapidated old shopping center that's tenants are changing over. So um, it's a huge challenge. Um, we just touched on while well, we're on a break and we're going to talk about it a little bit more, but we just talked about it's not only a challenge to find it and how and to be able to afford it, but the timing um, is it could take, I mean, I'm not even going to say a year at this point, probably a year and a half to two years to like buying a property, getting your tenants, getting it entitled. So you're you're owning and you're holding. Um, and actually I would say that in the last two years because of COVID, as many people worked from home and went to school from home, the cities went home. And for some reason, the priority level wasn't as aggressive as far as turning over plans and turnaround. So that's been a huge challenge. And then we get into the challenge of commodities and timing and product. So, um, so anyway, we've covered a lot and we'll, we'll circle back to some of that as well into some of these other questions we talked about during break. But I'd like to talk to Erwin and maybe you could come up here because sure. um, of the Zoom audience. Sure. But we've got the first page of, a, I mean, really literally a first class brochure um, of Irwin's project in Topanga, um, in Woodland Hills, Topanga Village Plaza. Irwin even got them to change the name of the street to Irwin Avenue. Actually, no, but um, I thought, you know, it's one thing to have somebody kind of stand up here and talk to you and throw numbers and reports and um, try to absorb all of it. But I thought great to have Erwin talk a little bit about how'd you get this A plus property? I mean, and I don't even, you're going to have to talk about how good it is when we get to the aerials and you see um, this corner is at a signalized intersection across from major regional retail and major office and huge residential. So um, how'd you find the site? So I've been in the real estate business for about 30 years. And like that- True 30? 
True. Oh, well, I'm probably, <laughs> yeah, see, I'm probably over 30. Yeah, so. we say 30 plus. Yeah, 30 plus. And uh, like Kathy, I spend a lot of time in the car driving and looking at real estate. And I can tell you, I've probably driven by this site numerous, numerous times. My name is Erwin, E R W N. That's actually my middle name. When my parents named me, I was like, I really, when I was growing up, it's kind of a tough name, but I love it now because it's unique. Uh -huh. And uh, drive by the site, I'm like the Tango and Girl. That's a great site. There's Office Depot, there's Toys R Us. Um, never in a million years did I think I'd be standing up today, up here, speaking about this, this property. But we got lucky. Okay? Luck comes through relationships and hard work and, and really uh, just we got a phone call and the phone call was from a broker that we've known for years bill bowen bill bowen who's one of the best brokers in the business and he's just a, a phenomenal uh, guy he's actually the guy that introduced me to mark Regan, kathy spoke about who's currently my partner and um i actually got hired at regency, regency centers which is publicly traded REIT, specialized in grocery anchor real estate because of Bill. And long story short, I've been working with Mark for the past 23 years. So we got a call from Bill, and Bill goes, Hey, this is owned by Catellus, and it's not really their profile. They don't specialize in retail, and they may want to get rid of it. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is, this is incredible. We have, we have to see if we can get this. So this is, yeah, this is a beautiful rendering, but then when, and then maybe just really quick in a great brochure like this and the brokers put this together for you, you know, prominent location. I'll let you keep telling your story. I'm just changing the pages. Of yeah. So, so, so the site, it, it's really 82,310 square feet anchored by Toys R Us. We specialize in buying older sites and well-located highly trafficked uh, intersections. Our goal is to bring a grocery anchor into all our shopping centers. Why is that? Well, we talked about necessity. There's actually more trips to grocery stores than any other retail type, which means more trips. If you have more people coming to the center, the side shops actually do better in terms of sales, which means there's greater rent credit. Okay. So, one of the things that we always talk about is the retail gravity. And this is in Woodland Hills. It's in Warner Center. There's huge daytime population. There's huge employment. It's directly across the street from uh, uh, Westfield Topanga. It's part of the entitlements for Westfield Topanga. Westfield had to do a number of offsite improvements, including a signal which allowed left out, which was a within this signal right there. Exactly. So this signal right here. So Westfield on Westfield on this, Westfield on this, they on that. And are I you just, are you all familiar who Westfield is? You've probably been in and out of there a few. They're based out of Australia, one of the largest mall owners in the world. And their capital investment was huge. I mean, it was a I think it was in the billions of dollars make this when we bought this there was a specific plan in place that they were working on it wasn't fully adopted it did not allow residential okay this is when we bought this and when we bought it we paid a we paid a pretty price okay and my partner was actually in the los angeles business journal and said are we getting into an overheated market because paragon paid a big price well we paid a big price on low rents. Well, all I do is look for low rents. Boys R Us, which used to be in this box, that lease was signed in 1972. I was five years old. Okay, five years old. And we always felt that something was going to happen with Boys R Us because of debt issues because they were owned by private equity. And we always felt if we could ever get to back that box, we've got the ability to do grocery store there. 
In addition, Office Depot, they're at 25,000 feet, they had fair market value options. Okay. So the key to this deal also is not only getting ball control and being able to buy it, but having a capital partner that's willing to wait. Okay. That's willing to, in other words, that has some patience because if Toys R Us never went bankrupt, they would still have options today. Okay. But we got to, they went bankrupt. We were able to get the space back. In addition, one of the things that happened here is there used to be a retail box right here. It was uh, occupied by a company called Off Broadway, affiliated with Broadway department stores. They were paying a huge, huge rent, big rent. And when the when the specific plant got adopted, it allowed residential. So we went to Off Broadway. We were able to enter into a termination agreement with them and then sell that to a residential developer who just put 300 units in. So the value, and here, here, here's the great thing about retail. Look at, look at the FAR here, the floor area ratio. What I mean by that is they've got 300 units here. There's no surface parking. I've got surface parking here. The value, quite frankly, on the, the highest and best use here is residential. But it's encumbered by long term leases. So retail is really a good, good, good opportunity there. Um, we were approached, um, and this is the first Amazon Fresh in the entire world. Has anybody been in an Amazon Fresh? And Amazon Fresh is the grocery grocery concept by Amazon, and they're doing a number of uh, stores. And uh, again, long-term relationship with their broker. Um, we had to sign a confidentiality agreement that if I violated it, they'd probably kick my dog away. <laughs> so I would not be uh, would not be happy. But we had to get a conditional use permit. Anybody know what a conditional use permit is? It's approvals from the city of Los Angeles to allow the sale of alcohol. Yeah. Well, and there could be conditional use permits for when I want to go into a property and it's not zoned for a drive through we have to go through the same process. We call it this, I mean, CUP for short, but a conditional use permit. So you can change actually the permitted use. Exactly. And it, it, that was a key component for the grocery. Well, we had to go to the neighborhood council and everybody in the neighborhood council is like, this is great, but who's your tenant? Like, I can tell you, I've got a confidentiality. It's a great, it's a great grocery store. So everybody would guess, we've got trade rates. I can tell you, we got some rounds. Hard to market when you can't. Market. Hard to market, hard to market. And honestly, this, this site's been 100% leased since, since we bought it. I mean, the, 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 there's really no vacant space. Um, we had to get elevations for approvals. Okay, elevations because we re elevated it, we created a better signage bandwidth, etc. Boys R Us was built uh, with concrete block. Again, it's built in 1972. Okay, uh, building codes the thing about the Northridge earthquake, what happened to building codes? Building codes changed. And we had to do huge seismic retrofit on that building. We had to blow out some of the CMU block, create storefront with glass. It was not a structural enhancements. It was not cheap to do. Long story short, we were able to get this project approved by the city of Los Angeles, the Amazon open, and it's an amazing asset. It really is. And again, it's luck and relationships that led me to where this is. So it's a long game. Real estate's a long game. It takes time. You got to be patient. I love it. Okay. From, the, from the onset of identifying to how long did it take to get open? Oh, it's probably <laughs> five years. Five years? Yeah. Five That's years. a lot of holding power. A lot, a lot. Yeah. I mean, it. It, it, it takes time. And from my 
identification from the first time I drove this site, five years from essentially, you know, when we were like, when Phil Downey called this, mm -hmm. right? Right. But when I identified this site, I was 15 years. Mm -hmm. So it takes, it takes time, but I love looking at real estate. It's to me, when you look at, okay, a lot of the things that Kathy talked about, access, signal here, guy left in here, access point, access point, access point. It'll show on the other two, access. yeah, but access, access. And one of the things I'll point out as we talk through the deck is that, you know, I've seen deals that people are like, do you want this corner? And Carol sketch it on this cocktail napkin um, about this big. It's like, I need a little more. As we walk through this deck, I mean, excellent presentation because it's pointing out everything that we want to see. If I'm having to sell, if I'm Amazon, well, Amazon's going to sell it, but any tenant that's like, you know, this is where we want to go and this is why. It's built, they're identifying everything. Um, it's a little hard to see. You'll see it better on the deck, but here's Irwin Street. Um, calls out the cars per day um, as it does on Topanga. 47.6 on Topanga. Calls out right now the, the big boxes, but as we go to the next slide, here's so 40, another 40, shot. 47.6 on one, one street. street. Right? I mean, yeah. anything above 35 on two streets is great. Yeah, we're like 20 plus, but you know, we're a Midwest company and that's kind of generic. But yeah, I mean, th this is huge. It's huge traffic counts. And, and the traffic counts are so important, but even more important is that they have easy access with the signals and the access points. Because if it was, if there were not the signals, that traffic would just be flying by and people would not feel safe stopping and turning in. Um, yeah, e so yeah. easy thing to do. Like I love Google, Google Maps, Google Earth, Google Earth yeah. is just absolutely amazing. You can look at the parking lot, it's, there's not a lot of space. Um, sites parked at four and a half per thousand. Okay, so that's four and a half spaces for every thousand square feet. So there's there's lots of parking. Typical retail is more in the four per thousand range. So we, we actually got. More party, but this is an extremely busy area. So daytime population, you've got a lot, of, a lot of employment there. What happens? A lot of people come here for lunch, and and there's a lot of traffic and pedestrian trips. Plus, you got residential density directly behind you as well. Um, you've got uh, transit as well. You got freeway on and off. And this is a this is an amazing piece of property. This when is the residential? He's over. Oh wow! And uh, he just he just signed Fogo to Chow, so he's doing a restaurant on the ground floor. Um, part of our agreement was to have an easement, which allows cross access between the two properties there. So that was negotiated as, as part of the project. But again, we didn't anticipate doing residential here. We did. We took our basis and reduced our basis significantly because, because of the sale. Right now. This is a amenity driven development. Um, so they are very looking for high end customers. And then, if, if to, to really relate back to what Kathy was saying about the segmentation, tapestry, the tapestry the segmentation. Yes. And I was reading that and it was. Uh, Technological educators. They work in technology, they love technology. What does Amazon focus on? Technology. They've got they've got shopping carts that you don't have to check out. It takes cameras, you can put product in, cameras will shoot what the product is, it will go directly to your prime account, charge you, and you walk out. Okay. And so technology is advancing so quickly in real estate. Mm -hmm. And again, I mean, just, just, just the data that Kathy shared with us in terms of analyzing trade areas, analyzing sites, analyzing you know, traffic patterns, it's, it's continuing at a big, big pace. Uh, I was just curious, um, are there any, are these projects already all done or is there any that's still coming up? Are you like excited about or are you well, I'm, I'm, I'm always excited. I, so 
what I do is I look at rentals. Okay. I, I read leases a lot and I look at rentals. And rentals are my contractual obligations with tenants. And for example, Office Depot has some term left. And at some point, I'm going to get that space back. Okay. If I get that space back, if everything goes well, I should be able to raise rents. Okay. So let's just take, for example, 30,000 square feet. Okay. Let's assume I can raise rents by $8 a foot. So eight times 30,000 is 240,000. Okay. Put a five cap. You know what a cap rate is? Put a five cap on that. Okay. There's $4.8 million just in, just in that incremental rent increase. Okay. So what's the name of the game? The name of the game is find low lease rates, well located properties that you can raise rents. Now, Kathy doesn't like when landlords raise rents. I get it. But, uh, you know, we're, and we're not, I mean, our goal is really to have a vibrant shopping center. We, we, with great tenants that drive traffic and merchandising and co-tenancy is key, having the right, like, for example, you know, Habit or, or Wendy's or uh, Chipotle, Chick-fil-A. I'm, I just did a deal with Chick-fil-A in front of Target. Target loves Chick-fil-A. They're like, great customer service, brings in families. They got a quick turn. They're very efficient. They keep big volumes. They're closed on Sundays, which is one of the peak times for Target. So it's a good, it's a good match. Where did you do that? Small mm. Yeah, you thought? Yeah. No, Chick-fil-A is a superior tenant. They, they, like you said, excellent operation. Um, when we're out looking at competition and looking at markets, talking about being kicking the dirt, checking out the competitors, um, you go in the restaurants, you get greeted, you, um, the service is amazing. The restrooms are so clean. It's the only customer I think I've been in that actually has have diapers um, for moms that need, you know, so they, they are really, really customer focused. And so is that and out. I mean, right. I mean and, and I think, I think, the concept of in and out where they do something and they do something really well, Chick-fil-A. I think that's a good lesson for everybody. Focus on what you want to specialize in and do it really well. Okay, yeah, we're talking about, okay, so yeah, this is a realistic site plan. This is a developer's, uh, no, this is a nice typical shopping center in the sense that um, you've got your great acres, you've got your your parking, um, when we're talking about you know, your access points are a little more well defined here, 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 in the back. If I'm on this corner and I'm talking about a protected area, um, I'm going to be, I'm going to try to highlight this area that's going to just cover my cross access and parking. If everyone ever wants to bring somebody else in in that home depot space, um, you know, it's like we don't, we're not going to walk. We're not going to have rights. We might ask for rights if they change tenants, but the developers not going to give that to us. But we're going to at least want to protect, you know, where our customers are coming on and off the property and where we're doing that. Right. So, so protected area, critical access points are key. The route for delivery is key. You can't deliver to your store. You can't stock your store. You can't sell merchandise. So that's super key. But and I negotiate a lot of leases with tenants, and some of these box tenants, the first LOI they send is my protected area is the entire site. Hmm. Okay. Thanks. You got to ask for it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, there's this. This is it's just a good site, City Bank, six thousand feet. And what do you think about that? Where are banks going? They're shrinking. How much more business are are they doing on mobile apps? A lot more. Do they need six thousand feet? Probably not. So, is there an opportunity to put in another type of use? Real estate's ever changing, and you can't just sit and look at it and say, "I'm fine." It's 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 never changing. You always got to be looking at what's going to happen next year, the next five years, etc. You've got a pad of shared retail out on the heart corner. You've got almost two opportunities for end caps because 
of the way it lays out, um, both Sharkies and who's that on the other? Both Burger. Yeah. Right. So this gets just a little more detail, another view. Um, but again, as a tenant, we love to see brochures like this. We love to, you know, help. They've done their homework and um, really, really thorough. And again, he's working with pros, the brokerage team that we have working with them. And then we jump into a little bit of, you know, they've included some of the mapping, similar mapping to what we've already pulled. Um, but they're pulling from a much larger trade area. So look at their 10 mile, um, their 10 mile population. Really Pretty amazing. Um, this LA, that's that's why LA is so tough to do business. It's a great place to do business, it's really tough to find availability. But so a couple couple things to mention too. So the, the, the retail draw from the regional mall is a lot more than a grocery and shop. Typically, the grocery anchor shopping center is three miles. The mall is like 10 to 15 miles. So across the street from the mall, there's huge benefits to us. And I think on, on that shopping center list, that identifies, you know, where, where are the super regional malls? How far are they going from? That gives you an idea. So they're, um, they're not in the shadow by any means, but they are benefiting from that heavy, heavy, uh, regional and it's not just the one center i mean it's an expanded regional stretch right there of shopping three really regional draws yeah and what's the other thing about regional malls what do you think operating expenses are to yes. operate a regional mall? expensive <laughs> is there a surface park typically not back in the old days back in the day yes but yeah. now because um, the trends are shifting, right? It's um, talk about underground and more open air. Um, they've blown out the old kind of diner floor malls that were all enclosed um, and open them up. And so, yeah, not a lot of surface parking. So, Coles, who Kathy was, yeah, was a real estate director there, their strategy was to be off mall with surface parking. You've got surface parking, you got lower operating expenses. You're across the street from the mall, you've got the center of the mall. So I, I could quote all day long cheaper rents in my neighborhood. That's a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. So this is um, this is kind of an example when we're talking about a trade area barrier. Now, in for for the regionality factor. That's not going to be a barrier for the people that are coming, but for the neighborhood customer, this in essence is going to be somewhat of a trade area barrier. And just like at the unit count 2018, 13,773, 2021, 15,772. So there, there's, there's a big growth, and I guarantee it's more than that. Right? Because residential is on fire. And a lot of the residential in this area, they're not, it's not lots that people are building in homes. These are lots that people are tearing down and building multi-family, multi-tenant, or yeah, multi-family simply. Because it's just already, it's already all been built. And they have there's huge numbers. And retailers love residential clients, right? People that are in shops, families, grocery stores love, love residential. They love to that pop too. And if you look at a lot of the grocery stores, if you walk into Whole Foods, the prepared food section is gigantic. The profit margins on prepared food are big. So if they if they can locate in areas with high daytime pop, it adds to the profitability of the store as well. And they also get that concern. On this uh, particular Amazon uh, location, if you walk in, They've got about an 8,000 square foot section where they've got um, employees filling out orders for online um, shops. So in other words, somebody will order turkey or milk and this and that. They'll, they'll put that, grab it on the, on the sales floor, bring it out and put it in lockers. People can either show up to pick it up or they'll have it. So efficiency and getting that last mile 
We talk about last mile a lot. It's the most mild terms of distribution. Um, I think Amazon was like everybody probably seven years ago, eight years ago. Everybody's like, oh my God, retail is going the way of the go to the mm -hmm. right? And all of a sudden, Amazon goes, we're opening up stores, we're buying whole foods. Why is it? Because of distribution to the consumer. Right? So, not only is retail serving like you know, goods, it's also acting as distribution points. So what you're going to see a lot more of in terms of retailers, in terms of store prototypes, is they're going to have a lot more back in house, less sales for, and there's a lot more better inventory management. Target, for example, we do a lot of work with Target, and I don't know if it's read that, but they're doing a lot of pickup stalls in their locations. Mm -hmm. and they just announced genius because they have in-store Starbucks in their stores. We'll deliver coffee to you when you pick up your goods. And the freebie? But, well, I don't think it's free. <laughs> I, I don't think it's free, but but, but it's not there, but it's yeah. But nice. if you're if you're a mom and you've got kids and you want your coffee and you've got product, mm -hmm. you oh, don't want to get out of the car. It's amazing. It, nice. it just it just it just Do you want to touch on the article that you uh so Today, uh, there was an article in the Daily Breeze that the Rams are looking at this facility to do their training facility. The Super Bowl champion oh, wow. Rams? Which is amazing. And it came out today, right before this. It's great, right? So, um, I mean, not that you don't have enough bodies there to, you know, service your community anyway, but that'd be great. It's kind of like it's kind of like if you know when you buy a house and you paint it and it looks nice, and then the house next door somebody else buys it and they paint it and they put in fountains and water features. Well, guess what? The neighbor with one is less than a third of that. So buy next to to great operators, you can be the, the second choice, but you're still going to win in terms of appreciation. Any questions? All right. Thank you so much. I mean, it's such a great story. Thank you. And, yeah. All right. Well, um, we've, we've touched on a few of these topics, but we're going to talk about, um, you know, some of, you know, the changing dynamics in you know what we're out there doing, um, and and how important it is to stay relevant, to not sit back and sit in your office and make decisions off of Google Earth, to be out in the field, to to have your brokers and network like constantly. You want to constantly be out there reading about retail trends and restaurant trends and who's hot and who's not. So we talked a little bit about you know raising canes. Um, you know they're coming to the market in a big way. Um, and they're doing huge volumes. Um, and, and who's going out? Well, you know, KFC's struggling. They're trying to stay relevant, but, you know, who's been to KFC in the last, um, I don't know. But, you know, so it's like, be careful. You know, we're, we're out there really constantly monitoring it. And, you know, whether you're doing your news, you know, virtually or, you know, checking out the papers, it's just like, you know, Erwin walking in with that article today. I mean, things are changing every day. So keeping up on that, um, we're keeping a really close eye on trade areas shifting. Um, you know, there's areas, there's something called blight and you'll be in a market where it's like, all of a sudden, you know, um, you know, something's changed in the market and people are moving out. And, uh, stores are closing down because maybe in a mall, maybe an anchor tenant has gone dark. Well, if an anchor tenant has gone dark in an enclosed mall, all those bodies aren't coming to the mall. So all of those, because all those tenants inside the mall are shuttering. So what's going to happen? Um, so keeping an eye, and that's the kind of thing that, that Irwin's looking out for because those are opportunities. All of a sudden, if somebody's holding that land and they don't want to hold it long term, they want to get out of there. It's an opportunity to come in and repurpose, um, repurpose that property. Um, I mean, look at the brands that have, I mean, Sears used to have what 3,500 stores across the country. They're down to 182. 
Um, there's groups that have taken those big Sears properties, and what are they doing? They're blowing them up. Um, they're retenanting them with multi-tenant. They're putting restaurants in there. They're putting food halls in there. Um, so again, really close to kind of you know keep a close eye on on all that. Macy's, um, another tenant that um, is kind of shifting closing stores. A lot of these tenants were hit really really hard. You know, considered non-essential during COVID, so they weren't able to service the customer. They weren't set up with the digital platform that many of these, you know, that Amazon or any, uh, many of the others had the opportunity to do. Um, CVS, the same, closing a lot of stores. And um, if you look, they're, they're saying they're uh, closing 9% of the 10,000 locations and 300 per year after that right now. And that's a customer shift to digital. So markets are changing. Um, but again, you know, failures for many are, are opportunities for others. Um, what internet can't provide customers is the experience and the service. So people are wanting to come out and, and kind of embrace being out there and having new unique opportunities. Um, and we talked about it just briefly, but back in, they did say that, you know, most people are thinking bricks and mortar we're going away. Bricks and mortar are your buildings, right? Your buildings and your retail centers. It's it's never going to go away entirely. You're going to have a combination of both, and it's how we how well you can accommodate both. Um, and again, to tar, uh, to Irwin's point, when how well can you accommodate accommodate both people coming in and people that want the quick service, parking spaces, delivery, um, etc. So. Um, you know, so what do we do as a tenant or a retailer um, with these unforeseen circumstances? Um, COVID hit many hard. Um, when it first hit, everybody was kind of at a standstill. Um, what do we do? Um, if we're gonna have to shut our doors, there's tenants that said, you know what, we're just stopping paying rent to the landlord. Well, it's not the landlord's fault that there's a worldwide pandemic. Um, yes, the tenants had to shut their doors, but then you figure out how you can, you know, how do you keep doing business? A lot of us in real estate, we stopped everything and we said, we got to talk to all these landlords. And in our case, we said, you know, it's not our landlord's fault, but you know what, can we ask to defer rent? We don't know what's going to happen right now. So can we, so we, our whole entire team jumped on the phones and talked to landlords and said, you know, we're going to pay you because we know it's not your fault, but can we take it, you know, can we not pay rent for six months and we'll start paying, you know, back pay a year from now or six months from now. So there are many, many negotiations that happened. Um, in my case, there's, we have so many great investors in Wendy's and we call them kind of keep on clipper, you know, that some of these people are counting on this for their retirement. And I'd have conversations with some of these, these people and that say, well, this is our income. This is our monthly income. Like, you know what? It's okay. <laughs> we'll keep paying you rent. I mean, because again, back to the days, you know, like do the right thing, like right. So, so we're, you know, you, we weren't too too tough on that. There were some bigger tenants, um, huge restaurant companies that just didn't pay rent. So those landlords were in a tough spot. Um, um, but what happened for us also is that it turned out that we were considered an essential business. We were lucky enough with the drive-through. Um, so typically our drive-thrus do about 65 to 70% of our, our business. Well, we had to shut our dining room. So then it became, you know, 90, 95% of, of our business and the rest was kind of digital platform. Um, and so we ended up in double digit sales increases during COVID. We got really, really lucky in the drive-thru business. Well then, so what happens ever spurs everyone on to be in the drive-thru business. At first we're like, oh, there's gonna be all these people that are gonna go out of business, these independents with drive throughs And but today there's so many more people that want to be in these drive through locations. So it's really tough. It's like, no, there's not a lot, a lot of low-lying fruit at this point. Um, but so still super, super competitive. Um, so what have we done with some of this is we've, you know, we've redesigned our building. We've designed, um, we've decided, you know, we're, we're, we've got a drive through only prototype. I'm not 100% convinced on that one, but we did, re, we had to redesign, you know, more parking, more convenience for our, our Uber drivers. Um, 
our pickup. Um, so, you know, going through huge challenges working through COVID, I think we're kind of coming out and seeing the other side, but, you know, it's, it's, um, it's about kind of keeping an eye on the future and how well you can operate. I mean, it's not just going to be, there's going to be circumstances one way or the other, right? So, for example, we just had a situation in Glendale, Arizona, a very unfortunate situation where a kid in the drive through lane decided to pull a gun out because he couldn't get the barbecue sauce he wanted. The kid bent down to get whatever he's going to get, and the guy shot a gun through the drive through and shot another kid that was, we think the guy at the drive through at, at our window may have, might have been something related to those two, but a kid got shot. We shut the restaurant down. Um, we're helping the kid. Um, that got hurt, but what we've done is we've, the, the restaurant is still closed. We're gonna, um, we're gonna change it to drive through only and pick up only. They're working on bulletproof windows and, you know, um, actually a delivery system that is kind of like, like the old banks with the tube service that it kind of comes out. So what are you gonna do? You're on this, you're at this location, you wanna keep serving the customer. But um, I mean, if we heard it once, we've heard it, a hundred times in COVID, you got to pivot. You got to kind of figure out what you can do, um, what you can do to make it work. So, um, one one thing that I, you know, kind of just looked at as far as how hard businesses would hurt. It, it's like we know now that so many consumers are way more aware of local, you know, your local shops, and they're going to they're going to support local shops. Um, and, and actually we saw a lot more making your meals at home. So what did a lot of the restaurants do that the restaurants that couldn't service um, their customer, the dining rooms were shut, they were starting to make meal kits. It's like, come in, you know, like here's the pasta, here's the sauce, here's the, oh, by the way, here's some wine. Thankfully the cities were letting them like to go alcohol. So pivoting. Um, so, and one of the things that we're seeing too through COVID is there's, I would say less, Spending power to more focus on value. So it's a huge, you know, huge competition towards um, these value creators. Any questions on challenges? I mean, there's more than just these challenges, but um, but they're just kind of touching on the state of the economy today. Yeah. How much, you know, like you think about all this technology that's replacing labor and that's hard. What do you see that? Well, it's, um, it's a, labor is a huge issue um, in California, even more than other states. With sit down restaurants, there's no tip credit. Um, so restaurants are having to pay more to operate in California. But um, yes, labor is an issue. Um, people aren't wanting to work. Um, so what we've done is we've, we have kiosk opportunities. So you walk in and it's almost contactless because you're walking in, you're ordering, you know, from the kiosk and you're, you don't really even have to talk to anybody, um, and it saves a couple of people that are up front. We've been in some small towns. We were in Warrington, Oregon, and um, opened on a Home Depot pad, and we're pretty proud of this new kiosk technology. And this elderly gentleman came in and said, "You know what? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna shop here or eat here because you're taking jobs away from people in our neighborhood that I think need jobs because you do high tech. So it's about knowing your customer and where it makes sense." Right, those are the people who want to come in. They want to talk to somebody. They're retired. They want to have their coffee, take their time. So you got to be really careful where you're kind of, you know, working through that. Um, we did spend a little time on this slide before. Um, I think mainly what I wanted to kind of point out when you're talking about numbers and growth is, um, again, like how fascinating it is that Starbucks got to be where they are um, as quickly as they have. But, but they're not doing all ground up stores. They're going inside retailers. They're going inside airports. They've got a footprint that can go many, many places. So the store count is very high. But what's interesting is looking at the numbers, total change from units um, and the next, look at Subway that was 1600. Um, because you talk about, you know, brands and how relevant, and, you know, I don't know. We're not, you know, you got so many great sandwich alternates now over and above Subway. They've kind of dated themselves. They haven't kept up. Um, so I, just an interesting slide I got there. 
All right. I was going to touch base on, you know, you, you we've looked at the market and we're, we're, we've talked about how challenging it is to come, you know, what we're going to look at and why we want to be where we want to be. We've got our customers. We found a site and whether, you know, an independent landowner owns it or we're part of a shopping center and we want to negotiate with the developer. Um, I was going to provide an entire letter of intent, but that was a bit much just talking about, um, you know, from the top, you, a letter of intent is typically a non-binding letter. So it's a, a letter, it's a kind of, it's more than a handshake, but it's not binding. It's not a lease. It's not a purchase agreement. So um, you're going to, uh, you're going to start with a typical letter format, you know, you're, who you're, who you're making your deal with and, um, and you want to detail the site description, whether it's an address, whether it's the northeast corner, the southeast corner, south of the southeast corner, um, very descriptive as far as location and size if you can. And um, you're identifying your tenant. And this kind of circles back to your question before is, you know, is it Wendy's um, or is it a franchisee? And at that point, it's very um, diligent for the owner or the landlord to say, who am I doing the deal with? I want to see your financials um, because there's people that hold properties in you know separate shells or LLCs. So that's the time for a landlord to know, you know, am I serious about going down the road with this tenant? Um, identify the landlord, um, and then a whole variety of terms and options depending on what type of tenant you are. Um, we typically do a 15, 20 year deal. And we, we like to have three or four or five year options. In the state of California, you actually can't go over 35 years where it actually is considered a purchase. So you're taxed differently, but um, you're gonna talk about um, your rent and your primary term. And typically you're gonna identify that all the way through um, your options and your, I'm looking at 10% bumps every five years. The developer's looking at 15% or more every five years. So that's a negotiation in itself. I don't even note percentage right here, but there's a lot of restaurant companies, um, and a lot of landlords that look at, you know, if you're successful, I want a piece of the business too. I mean, maybe give you a little bit lower rent, but I'm gonna give you 5%. I want um, your break points gonna be 5%. So if that's a whole negotiation. We, should, we, we tend to avoid that whenever we can, but, um, but landlords can get it. Um, Let's see. And so then we're going to touch on just rent commencement. You know, when are you going to start? When are you going to start paying rent? Um, and kind of back to the identifying the property, negotiating the letter of intent. Um, when we get a letter of intent signed, we have to get our capital committee approval. We've got a feasibility period where we're investigating the site. We've got a permitting period. And we're going to want to make sure that we're protecting ourselves that we're not opening our doors, that we're not paying rent until we actually open our doors for business. And that can be tough on a landlord because we need a lot of time um, because it's not us as much as getting the approvals through the city. Um, in many cases, we have to go through a CUP, conditional use permit to get a drive-through approved. Or like Erwin was saying, it was just, they had to do that for Amazon because it wasn't approved for alcohol sales. So these deals take a long time. Um, you talk about permitted use. So if I'm going to go in as Wendy's and my landlord wants to make sure I'm going to stay at Wendy's or I'm going to stay at a restaurant, I'm not going to have the liberty to just change to Joe's Cigar Shop drive through if I'm not doing business, you know, if I'm not doing business, I want. So you, that can get pretty technical, um, but good to point out in your letter of intent. Um, and we get to exclusives. We touched a little bit about, we talked a little bit about co-tenancy, who you want to be with. I'm certainly not going to want to see another burger in the same shopping center. Um, I don't know that I necessarily want to see a, a chicken in the same shopping center. I was saying our, our menu mix has gone to um, about 35% or more of chicken. So I was saying during the break that we negotiate both ways. We negotiate, if Chick-fil-A is there, we're saying, Oh, we can operate with you, no problem. But if we're there and Chick Fil A wants to come in, we say, "Oh man, no, too much chicken. We want to keep you out." So it's it's a negotiation, um, and sometimes 
yeah, you pay for the right to have, you know, to, to, to get the right to come into a center like that, but negotiation. Um, and then you, well, you talk about a little bit co-tenancy is that if I'm looking at a shopping center and I've picked this shopping center because I like, I like the anchor tenants. And if I'm big enough and I have enough weight and I'm paying enough rent, then I'm going to say, I, if that, if they go dark, if that Walmart goes dark, or if that Target goes dark, I want my rent to be reduced because I'm counting on them to bring in that business. On occasion, landlords will like allow you to do that. But um, again, but I tend to like sites that the, the tenant, the anchor tenants are a benefit, but that's not all we're counting on, right? So we've got the, so if you looked at Irwin's Corner at Irwin and Topanga, they benefit from the anchor tenants, but they would, if they went dark, they're still gonna have all that traffic and all that visibility. So if they do good business, they're still gonna, you know, people are gonna come to them. Um, yeah, so we just talked through, you know, um, there's a whole negotiation on contingencies. You gotta be really careful about getting your time. Um, our inspection, many tenants, like um, in the Panera site criteria that you'll look at, they're looking at a shell, they're gonna tell you, I need the, the landlord to build me the shell and our utilities need to be this capacity. Um, you need to be water, you need to be phone lines, so et cetera, et cetera. So you're ne negotiating that. So when you're going in to a deal and when you're entering into a lease, you know, you, you know you've got a really good parameter of what you're gonna be paying and the landlord knows what they're responsible for. So you know that at that point you're running your budgets you're running your construction budget, you're running your sales estimate, you're knowing if you've got a deal that's gonna make sense. Um, we didn't talk too much about common area, but or common area maintenance, but in that whole shopping center that we're talking about, that we saw the description on Irwin's plan is that there's a lot of cars coming on and off that property. Who's taking care of that parking lot? Typically the developer, the developer has a company that's taking care of that property because who's gonna restripe it? Who's gonna paint it? Who's going to maintain it? So we're paying rent, but we're also paying a common area charge. We like to go in and say, oh, we'll self-maintain and we'll sweep up around our building so we don't have that extra charge. But um, but the landlord's also paying insurance on that because who who's you know responsible if there's an accident in the access drives or the drive outs? So it gets a little more complicated. Um, and that's a negotiation in itself because it's an expensive piece of the puzzle. And um, you try to also control that cost over the years. Um, so there's the common area and there's um, the assignment gets a little more into the legal piece, right to enter. Um, again, I had a whole letter of intent that I was gonna include here, but it was just pages and pages of, I think it's a little more on the legal side. Um, and then you're just gonna identify what we call a right to enter is, it's like we want the ability to go out onto the property and do measurements and. When you get into lease, maybe you're going to negotiate that you could start to do some soils and surveys a little more in depth, but at least we have the right to go in and find out if the property works for us. Um, you negotiate whose purchase agreement or whose lease form primarily you're going to use. We like to use our lease form because we're really familiar with it. Landlords typically like to use their lease form, but you want to identify that. So that's essentially what's, you know, your signatures, and then you're going to have several pages of exhibits, which you're going to say, we're going into this letter. We know we're we know the site. We know what we're going to pay for rent. Um, here's the site plan we're going to use. Here's the parcel size. Here's typically there's a landlord work exhibit. Um, so that's just um, more that will go into the letter of intent. And I kind of wanted to touch on before we kind of really get to question and answer um, if there are any. I just wanted to touch on the vast array of different opportunities there are in, in the commercial real estate industry, also the residential side. You know, as you said, a lot of this pertains to, you can kind of parallel it to residential, but you know, this is, I don't need to read through every single one of these, but um, you get a feel um, when we're talking about the deck. Um, you know, we were able to see on the front page, you know, the brokers that I, that, you know, found the site. And then not only did they find the site, they're leasing the site for, for one, right? So um, they're out there getting the tenants to come in. So they're making commissions on those tenants coming in. 
Um, so, you know, any, and then I kind of explained to you that all as tenants, we've got our teams of people that are out there search, searching for sites. Well, you've got um, the corporate, you've got the brokers, you've got real estate attorneys, you've got paralegals, you've got um, all the data that we were talking about. There's people, analytics, and we have a whole team of analytical people that I run my reports and if I get stuck, boom, I've got the amazing girls that are back at corporate that set it all up. They set up our, you know, the whole, who's our customer? What are we looking for? In our mapping system, we might get a disposition list. I don't know if you guys know, for instance, who launched on Silver Reflex. So as a franchisee, launched on Silver, they're going out, do we want to acquire them? Well, our mapping people, they bought all the locations that are available. So we can just go in, see how close they are to existing restaurants, analyze them, you know, real quickly. So just a whole piece on the amazing side of technology these days. Um, and of course, lenders, city planners, general contractors, property, ma property management, asset management, goes on and on. And I joke about a little bit about, so ICSC is really, really a huge organization in the shopping center side of the business. I don't know why they changed their name. <laughs> they just did like a year ago. They, um, they changed their name to Innovating Commerce. I have to look at it every time, Serving Communities. <laughs> so it's always been ICSC. It's always been International Council of Shopping Centers. Um, we'll be going in May. They finally reopened the convention. I'll be going in a week to Monterey for Northern California ICSC. The one in Vegas is typically, I mean, I think it's been what, I think they have 76,000 members total, somewhere around there. But like the big conventions, you know, it'll be 20, 30, 40,000 people. And they have free student memberships, by the way. And if you register as a student, um, I kind of bounced around in there a little bit and they have, they have separate seminars that students can attend for free. So they'll have some, you know, industry, um, you'll know, have people from all ends of the industry that are ready to get back and sit down, kind of like we're doing here. It's like, let me tell you about our business. Let me tell you how you might be able to get involved. Um, let me introduce you to a few people. When my daughter came with us, she registered, she got in for free. Um, she attended some meetings with me. She attended some meetings with my husband, a very good friend, developer, grabbed her, took her to a dinner. She met the people that, that do real estate for a hot topic, the people that do, you know, um, boot barn. And it's just people that know people. They're like, meet her, meet this person. They're interested. Do you have a place for them? Um, just a really, probably the best place to network, I would say. Um, and tools. They have a lot of tools, a lot of learning. Um, so I think that's all I'm going to say in relation to all. You can read through those. Go on the end. Listen, Erwin, do you think, is there any other organization you think is as strong? I, I, well, for our, our side of those is the shop. So ICSC is the organization. Quite frankly, it, it allows us to be relationships with clients and other customers. The goal is really to have long term customers for my business. The way I look at it is tenants are my customers, and I, I got to talk to them. Do things better, I got to deliver them. Whether that's getting the profits bigger, getting their bills to build it sooner, getting their quality sites. So, I mean, there's lenders, there's, there's so many, there's so many construction and there's so many different things that are facets of real estate that you can get involved in. And it's, it's just an amazing business because you can touch so many different things. And I think the, the ability for you, I mean, everybody's in, we're in real estate right now, we're in this class, we're going to go into this. We're going to, we're going to socialize at, at, in, you know, real estate, you know, in, in the restaurant or whatever. Impact the society that you can have. Communication about building that great project is going to make me, I think, it's the best business in the world. One of the things I should have put on there is, and you guys already have access to and you're part of, when I mean, you've got RIA, you've got the members that have very different specialties, and every one of them is on that committee to help you, to help guide you help counsel you on your interests, right? 
So if you are more interested in, uh, in residential, or if you're more interested on the lending side or the investment or the 1031. So we've got that wonderful group that everybody is there to help. Coming away from this, um, I mentioned that, so you'll have my contact information. Um, my daughter is ready, willing, and able to talk to anybody that might have some questions. Um, somebody interestingly from LMU contacted her. She's like, did you already give my number out <laughs> about a week ago? And I said, no, not yet, but um, I'm contact me, text me, email me. I can get you in touch with Kristen because she has a great story from starting in not such a glamorous spot as an intern with a developer. And this was in 2012. They were shutting down a bit. They were still shutting down from the recession. So she was cleaning out plan rooms and she was you know, doing whatever they needed her to do. She was with Red Mountain for about six months. Yep. And then she got a real estate license. And then she's like, I want to try the brokerage side. Well, she got onto the brokerage side, but she didn't, they didn't say here, you're going to go do deals. They said, answer some phones, make some packages. And she's lucky enough to have had the experience of, you know, the guy that hired her, the company's called Maine in Maine. He was my broker when I was doing Brinker deals. Um, and he's like, we'd love to have her, but we're worried that she's going to come and leave. I'm like, well, she's a hard worker and she dedicated. So she was there just about 10 years, but, um, you know, she grew up around, you know, I'd be on weekends and I'd be like, the okay, next week I got people flying to Arizona and we've got a, you know, I've got books all over the dining room table and the, like the deck you saw, I'd have to create, you know, a section for each site we're going to tour with all this information. So everybody had all that information at their fingertips, you know, so she was around, she, I put her on an airplane and, um, she was little, so she loved, you know, being able to fly, stay in a hotel room. And um, one of my favorite stories was we're driving around, we're looking at doing Chili's deals out in Arizona. And so she's, she's like, well, what are we doing? Um, you know, we're driving all these neighborhoods. She said, well, why? Well, I want to see if, are these people, what kind of cars are they driving? Their new neighborhoods, do they have curtains on their windows or, or are they putting an aluminum foil just in the interim because they bought the house, but their house, you know, but they're poor, they can't afford to improve, the, you know, the landscaping or the curtains would maintain. So you, you drive to feel it. When I've talked about kicking the dirt, there's nothing like it. And she's, oh, maybe six. She said, well, isn't that kind of like spying on people? Said, yeah, actually, that's what we're doing. <laughs> that's exactly what we're doing. And she, and she loved going to the restaurants because like, well, we're doing a casual dining. So we got to go check out all of them. We got to go check out, you check out all the competitors. So it's all a piece of it. So she's got great, you know, and now she is, she just got married um, in October to another LMU grad. And um, she came back from her honeymoon. She's like, oof, I might not mind trying this tenant side. And she's with a wonderful restaurant company. There's another, um, another girl, her name's Natalie Pebbles. I think she may have done some stuff here before. But so she started about the same time Kristen started in 2012 and she was a broker. And she was a broker with, um, I know the broker owner and it wasn't the strongest of outfits. Um, and so she was struggling a bit. And I kind of counseled her as she just was thinking about going on the, the tenant side. And I'm like, well, you're gonna wanna talk like this and dress like this and you know, this is what it's gonna look like. And I can help give her a recommendation. And now I think she's been up with Jersey Mike's for 10 years and kicking. I mean, she's just a top producer and loving it. And I said, Natalie, I just texted her this morning. And I'm like, do you mind? She's like, of course. If, if anybody wants to reach out and get some advice from her as well, um, she's happy to talk to anybody that's um, interested. So, yes. What a story. Yeah. Oh, the name, the new name and the old name? Yeah. So forever, since it's an inception, to the best of my knowledge, it was called ICSC. It's called International Council of Shopping Centers. And now, I don't, I don't, most members, it's not like anybody voted. They just all of a sudden changed the logo. Um, but now it's called Innovating Commerce Serving Communities. So it's still got the same resources, same members. Um, and what's nice is like, so I'm heading to Monterey next week, two weeks um, for, a, we call it deal making. So that's a regional deal making. So I'll be, Northern California is actually one of the most challenging markets that I've ever worked. I've worked in Portland and Seattle, Hawaii, 
got deals done. Northern California is really challenging, um, but it's a chance to kind of have more local groups. We have a San Diego regional, they have a, all over the country. Um, retailers get in for free, so that's nice. My daughter was like, what? <laughs> After paying big prices as a broker all these years. So, um, and you know, I, yeah, and I love what I do and I've been doing it for so many years, but at the same time, it's given me, I've got a family that does a lot of real estate and restaurants. And so I've been able to kind of, I still look at, and I do invest in other properties, but that's not my full-time job. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to become a multimillionaire working as a tenant rep. Um, I love what I do, but it allows me a great balance of life. And again, by having my real estate license, and I think I meant to mention, um, you don't need a real estate license on the corporate side, because I'm not, I'm buying and selling, I'm buying and leasing real estate on behalf of a corporation. So I don't need my real estate license, but I have it for my own personal investments and future holdings. So um, anybody else have any questions? No, because it's Friday before spring break. <laughs> so why would you? <laughs> um, um, well, it's I been a, the only thing I want to mention is, is all the react members are pretty good. There's yeah, React is, is you really can't get away from it. And you mentioned the accounts and the traffic is very serious. Talk about this because I think this is great stuff. I mean, I, I've met so much that I really appreciate the comments. This the bench strength of React members. We had a relationship manager at Bank of America that had my interest in and not so much that we had a data access. And it was We didn't even talk about this, and then I was like, oh, yeah, he's, he's a part of it. So there's so many different people we can talk to about different asset classes. Retail may not be something that people are interested in. Them. And residential or different types of products, they're all well represented, and there's a great point in which they can all talk from and relationships. And I, I think I did mention before, but I mean, I, I mean, the fact that you have a real estate society and the REACT, you're already several steps ahead of uh, back in the day. Um, even though I was around it all my life, I hadn't, I didn't know that there was a niche like this. I didn't know the expanse of all the different facets. So like Erwin said, and I don't know if everybody on Zoom heard, we're reinforcing the fact that use the React resources. Everybody's there to help. Um, 